Good evening and welcome. I'm Bill Harmer, the Executive Director of the Westport Library. If one were to ask who is the greatest American rock and roll band of all time, the short list of answers to that in question would undoubtedly include the Talking Heads. How could it not? From the moment the band first appeared on the New York concert scene in mid-1975, playing on a CBGB bill headlined by the Ramones, it was clear that this band was charting a course all their own. From post-punk to funk, and with their own unique way of looking at the world through their songwriting, the band left behind a treasure trove of recognizable songs. From Psycho Killer to Once in a Lifetime to Burning Down the House, their songs, records, and music have remained an influence on wave after wave of musicians and music lovers alike. Well, tonight we are in for a real treat because we will be joined by the founder of the Talking Heads and 2002 Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductee, Chris France. Chris founded the Talking Heads with his girlfriend at the time and now wife of 44 years, Tina Weymouth. The core of the band consisted of Chris on drums, bassist Tina Weymouth, lead singer David Byrne, and ex-modern lover guitarist and keyboardist Jerry Harrison, who joined the trio in time for their first album. Chris's exceptional memoir, Remain in Love, published in 19, excuse me, in 2020, is the story of the band, of his marriage to Tina, and the relationship with Byrne. Tonight, Chris will share with us the beginnings of the Talking Heads, their days as art students at the Rhode Island School of Design, and later living on the Lower East Side where the music that defined an era was written. Chris will also discuss the challenges of life on tour and how he and Tina's romantic and musical connection led them to establish their own band in 1980, the Tom Tom Club. Tonight, Chris will be in conversation with Jennifer Bankser. Jennifer has been a part of our leadership team at the library for over two years now. Having grown up in Westport, she has deep roots to the community. Jennifer launched her career working for many years at the iconic Marketing Corporation of America while attending Fairfield University in the evening. After moving to other areas of the country with her family, she returned to town about a dozen years ago to work in nonprofit communications for the arts and cultural community, where she first met Chris France in her role as host of a regional arts and culture radio program on WPKN. And now I'm thrilled to turn the virtual podium over to Jennifer to get the conversation started. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Bill. Well, I am sh in sheer delight to be able to sit here with you tonight, Chris, and talk about your memoir, Remain in Love, which I have right here. It's an amazing cover. And you, it came out the summer, this summer. Um, we were hoping to have you in person, but we're wonderful to have, to have the wonderful technology to be able to visit with you virtually. And your book has been met with wonderful reviews. It's one of the top books for the Times of London. Um, Kirka's review talked about a, a more of a story of, of love and the love of music and the love of your life and a great book for those people who are interested in 70s and 80s rock and roll. The Wall Street Journal called the memoir electrifying, which it indeed is. Isn't that a good word? And my favorite review, which I think is on the jacket cover, is from Bill Murray. I'm just going to read it because it's just a nice way to introduce your humor and all. Bill Murray says, from the first time I saw Talking Heads live, CBGB 1976, I've had a huge thing for Tina Weymouth. And since then, I've been biding my time, waiting for the right moment to make my move. But after reading Remain in Love by Chris France, it's become pretty clear to me that she's already in a relationship. So I think that's a nice segue to talk about your book and your love story. So tell us, why now a memoir? And what did you hope, what was the tone and how did you th approach thinking about writing this amazing memoir? Well, <laughs> th th thank you for that very nice introduction. Um, hi, Jennifer. Um, hi. I I'd been thinking about writing a memoir for, for a very long time. I mean, at least 10 or 12 years, probably thinking about it more. And then, you know, thinking about it, thinking about it. Finally, people started saying, Chris, you should write a memoir. Chris, when are you gonna start writing that memoir? And, and then uh, I, I decided, well, I'm not getting any younger and 
there really aren't any bridges left to burn. So let's do it. And I, I, uh, I did it very properly. I got myself an agent, you know, a, a, a literary agent who mm -hmm. said to me, now this is what you got to do, Chris. You got to write three chapters. They have to be really good. And I will edit them. And I said, fine, cool. And then, I'll, then he'll present them to publishers. And so I did that and I handed it in to him. He said, oh, this is really good, good timing. I'm going to the London Book Fair next week. I'll take these pages to the London Book Fair and we'll see what happens. Well, the first day he was there, I had like a multitude of offers and I, I realized I realize that it's not because people thought I was a great memoirist or anything. It's because they love talking heads. Right, right. That, love the, the Tom, was Tom Club, and, yeah. they, and they love Tina. So those are the three heroes of my book, Talking Heads, Tom Tom Club, and, and Tina. But maybe not in that order. Maybe Tina's the, the real hero. Well, so that's so interesting to know that the, the minute the idea came up and you, you teased the publishing world with your memoir, you know, you, you knew you had something. Yeah. You, you, knew you, were, you were onto something. So that had to have been very inspiring. It was inspiring, but it also gave me this huge anxiety attack because I thought, oh, it's one thing to write three, three you know, chapters. Now I have to write like another 400 pages. Oh my God. And I, but but I, I managed to calm myself down. Yeah. You know how I did it? How? Completely legal way, uh, CBD oil that I bought oh. at the gas station. <laughs> and- uh, the writers out there, right? <laughs> it, it really worked. It, it just chilled me right out and I could work very, very easily and um i'm fortunate you about a special place in your world to write the book did you have a dedicated well, vacation or several or? i started off writing here at my home uh but you know i have two dogs two beagles and and also i have a lot we all work from home uh tina and i uh, everybody else who's under this roof works from home. So there's a lot of phones ringing and, mm -hmm. you know, microwave oven dinging and, and, and all kinds of stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, so I, I actually went over to uh, my, my local library, the Pequot library, oh, the other one. Place. And yes. I, yes. And I, I wrote a good deal of it there. Also, I wrote a good deal of the book in France in Brittany uh, where Tina's mother was born and where Tina still is like the steward of her family home there. Mm. And uh, the rest I wrote down in uh, the Bahamas, Nassau, oh, uh, by yeah. Compass Point Studios, where we, with Talking Heads and Tom Tom Club, we did much, much work and uh, pretty, pretty good work too. Well, that's interesting. I would think having those different locations, particularly being, being down in Compass Point, probably yeah jog the memory a little bit and it helped inspire and re maybe recreate some of the scenes a little more freshly in your mind being on it, location? It, it did. It, yeah. uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very fortunate to have a, a I'm knocking on wood here, <laughs> having a good memory, yeah. but, but uh, you know, a lot of my friends, uh, I, I'm of a certain age, a lot of my friends don't remember things. <laughs> Like, like, for example, it's, it's really wonderful. The, the detail and the, the fresh, it's very fresh, the book. The, thank you. Thank you. you. I, really, I, I really do get a flavor of what you were thinking and feeling at the time. So yes. that's memory for sure. Yeah. 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 Um, so it's, I, well, it's really interesting, I think, is um, to talking about your whole journey, your whole life journey to this moment today, right? Your, your, your childhood and your supportive family environment and how, how important that was to you and to, to allow you to become who you've become. So yeah. um, part of the story that I think is interesting is the moment as you were growing up when you really decided very consciously, I'm going to be an artist. This yeah. is what I'm going to do. And um, so can we talk a little bit about that and your family's reaction? 
Sure. Yeah. I, I, I can remember it very clearly. Uh, I, it was in the autumn and I was driving this secondhand Mustang that my parents had given me. I was, I was going to a, to a school that had no school buses. It was a private school. And so you had to drive yourself or get your mom to drive you, you know. But I was at the age where I could drive myself and, and, and I had this sort of pea green, terrible color, secondhand Mustang that my parents got me. But I felt pretty cool just having something to drive. And it was autumn and I, could, I can like smell the leaves, you know, the, uh, that autumn smell. And I think I was going to a soccer game to watch my friends play soccer. And uh, I said to myself, well, I'm going to be an artist. I'm going to do what my, my art teacher suggested I do, which is go to the Rhode Island School of Design. And I'm going to, I'm going to be a painter. Did that feel radical? Did that feel like a radical decision in the context of the world that you were brought up in? Yes, it did. I mean, I mean, the, in fairness, the same school had sent three young guys to the Rhode Island School of Design the year before me. So it, wa it wasn't like a totally, I wasn't the first from my school to go there, but it was sort of a break from the formula. Like, like at that school, it was called Shadyside Academy in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, a fine school. It's now co-ed. At that time, it, it was all boys and, um, you know, coats and ties every day. And uh, I mean, we, we were allowed to, to wear corduroy pants and stuff like that, <laughs> Levi's and stuff like that, but they had a strict dress code. It was old school, but they had some great teachers there. And um, uh, this, this particular art teacher was really good. He was a really good, some people say you can't teach art. And there might be some truth to that, but I, I believe there's some people that actually can. And, and uh, th this guy instilled in me a, a, a tremendous feeling that, that uh, you know, I don't have to follow the formula that, see at this school they were there, the whole idea was to build leaders for the community, which is a, you know, great thing to do. Sure. We need good leaders. Sure. But their idea of leaders really tended to be like board members and CEOs and, uh, uh, you know, doctors and lawyers, which is great. But, yeah. but I, I decided my father was a lawyer and a, and a soldier in the army. And I, I, I decided I'm, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to be an artist. And, um, and he was, his reaction when you told him that was? Well, both my parents were, uh, they, they always encouraged me. They were very supportive of my playing music and my doing art. But when it came to uh, going to art school, they were like, oh, Chris, how will you ever support yourself? And uh, they said to my, my art teacher, Mr. Miller, Mr. Miller, how will he ever support himself? Please don't recommend that he go to art school. And uh, Mr. Miller said, oh, but Mr. and Mrs. France, the Rhode Island School of Design is the Harvard of art schools. There you go. <laughs> and, and that was like the magic word. Oh, the Harvard of art schools. I guess Tribute to your parents for giving you the choice and supporting it and, and, and doing yeah. their due diligence as parents to share their concern. And then off you went to RISD. Right? Yeah. And this yeah. is in the mid seventies. Yes. 19, uh, well, no, the, the early, it was 1970. 1970. My first year. And, um, and uh, that's where I met Tina and that's where I met David Byrne and a whole lot of other great artists that I'm, still friends with to this day. Yeah. It sounds like it was a very, a great place to go to be nurtured with creativity and experimentation and try whatever kind of came your way that you wanted to try. Music obviously was something very important to you in your early years talking about the music that influenced you and what you enjoyed. You, you played the trumpet for a while as a child then switched over to the drum. So you went off to college 
as a drummer, as yes, having that. But you know, when I went off to college, I was at a point in my musical career where, where I thought, I don't think I really have what it takes to be a rock and roller. I mean, a true rock and roller. I was thinking of, you know, Keith Richards and Lou Reed and David Bowie and, uh, yeah. you know, Mark Bolin from T-Rex. I was thinking of people like that. And I thought, I can never be like that. Uh, so I'm going to be a painter instead. So I, I really dedicated myself to painting for a couple of years. And I love it. I loved it. I love it still. But I, I eventually I started really missing playing the drums, which in fact I'm missing right now because I haven't been able to play oh, with. No, it's so frustrating. For so, so many long. creative people and musicians and yeah. you know, our heart goes out to people in the creative world who can't practice their yeah, and their but, passion. but anyway, uh, RISD yeah. was wonderful for me. Uh, I think for all of us in Talking Heads, one good thing about it, and Tom Tom Club, one uh, thing that RISD instilled in us, I mean, really instilled in us, was that it's okay to be inspired and, and to be, um, you know, uh, motivated by yeah. artists that had come before you you know, like Andy Warhol or Robert sure. Rexenberg or Larry yeah. Rivers or Van Gogh, but you can't just copy them. You have to, you have to, you have to um, create something that is unique unto yourself. Right. It right. has to be unique unto yourself. Otherwise it's not even art. Right. So it's, it's innovation. So, art, art yeah. is very innovative very innovative people and so that and that also going to an art school and we can talk more about that having gone to an art school how that informed your approach to the talking heads and then even more so the tom tom club with the originality of yeah. your sound and picking things from all these genres and creating kind of a new sound which you did a little bit of right when you met uh david byrne at RISD. yeah we well you know when i first met david i i didn't i I didn't have any classes with him. So uh, I, I didn't meet him right away. I met him, in fact, after he dropped out of school and gone to another school and then come back. And we, he was just hanging around the campus with some other students. And, and a friend of mine was making a student film about his girlfriend getting run over by a car. Uh, a short film <laughs> and he said I, I need some music Chris I know you play drums so you think you could help me create some cacophonous music and I said sure man I, I'd love to so at the time I was keeping my drums in a the carriage house where Tina lived mm -hmm. she lived uh, on the up, upper floor the second floor of a, a carriage house in Providence and um she let me keep my drums there, which was great because the people in my apartment building really didn't like it when I played. That's a good <laughs> girlfriend, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so my friend Mark came over with, you know, the Nagra tape recorder and he said, he said, oh, I brought a friend with me who plays guitar. His name is David Byrne. And I, I kind of recognized David, but he had a whole new look he, before he had had like a very long beard and, you know, haircut that he cut himself and it was all choppy and it, he looked kind of like a hobo or something like that but now he was like wearing leather trousers and he had his hair short and bleached blonde and uh, he had a whole new thing going on so I uh, we did the thing for Mark uh, the rising cacophony and then uh, mm. diminuendo and I think we got it in one take, what he was looking for. And, uh, you know, basically the sound of a car crash, musical, musical yeah. car crash. Yeah. And uh, after that, David said to me, you know, I can play other stuff too. And I said, oh, really? Because hmm. I've been thinking about starting a band here at RISD, you know, to play parties and, and just, you know, purely, yeah. for, purely for the entertainment of our friends. And uh, he said, okay. And so we started this band uh, called The Artistics. And we had it 
the artistics went on for about two years. We never recorded anything, unfortunately. And I don't think we even have any photographs of ourselves, but. It was a different time. Now everything's photographed and recorded. Yeah, yeah, it, it was a different time. Although video was just coming out. And I think somebody made a video of us at some point, one of our performances, but, but it was fun. And David and I enjoyed playing together. And uh, of course I write about this in my book. How, how yeah, I mean, there's a lot, it's, I mean, it's really terrific to read all the ins and outs and, and how, you know, Tina came into the musical scene, so to speak, and, and at first being a little reluctant Yes, I, in fact, I invited. Yeah, club. in fact, in fact, I invited Tina to be a member of the art artistics, because uh, she had she had just become my girlfriend. Uh, that that's a story in itself, and it, it took a little while for me to persuade her because she had a different boyfriend at the time. Yeah. But I was <laughs> very. very patient. But I, 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 from dancing. I would, we would dance together in the student bar. There was a jukebox and everybody would dance. And I, I could tell this girl really feels the music. She's really getting this. What a great sense of rhythm she has. And so, so I invited her to join the band back then. But she said, probably wisely, she said, oh, no, no, no. That's rock and roll is a boys club. It's not for me. I, I think it's great you're doing it. And I'll, I'll drive your drum set around town for you in my car, <laughs> but I'm not gonna join the band. Okay, so she was observing and kind of, you know, supportive, but yeah. not very my, not supportive. my thing. Very yeah. supportive, very into it. And then one day, uh, David and I, you know, we played with the artistics, we played cover songs. We played like Paul Revere and the Raiders and the Velvet yeah. Underground and the, the Who and, Al Green and Smokey Robinson, uh, um, stuff, the kinks, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Uh, and Dance music. One, one, yeah, what we considered to be party music. And, that, and then one day uh, we said, well, maybe we should write a song, you know, an original song. And uh, we both agreed that we should try that. And a couple of days later, there, Tina and I shared a painting studio at RISD, and there was a knock on the door. I opened the door, and there was David Byrne with his acoustic guitar, which was a funky, uh, beat-up acoustic guitar that had paint splatters on it. And he said, I've, I've written a song. Uh, I've got the first verse and the chorus, and I'd like to know what you think of it. And it it's kind of loosely uh, based on the style of Alice Cooper. Mm -hmm. uh, Alice Cooper was very big and popular. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So he came in and he played, I can't seem to face up to the facts, I'm tense and nervous and I can't relax, mm -hmm. and, and went into the chorus and we were like, whoa, this is really good. And he said, yeah, but I need a couple more verses and I want the middle section to be in a foreign language to sound like a, a psychotic sort of disconnection. And uh, Tina, whose mother was from France, could, uh, and Tina speaks and writes French very fluently, uh, said, oh, I can do that. So she wrote the, the middle eight section or the bridge in French. And uh, I wrote a couple of verses and this all happened in like, a couple of hours. That's amazing. And uh, David wrote it all down in his notebook, his little spiral notebook. And we had our first song. It was called Psycho Killer. Which and, the bass, uh, I mean, that song, the notes yeah. get played and everybody now, my age, I mean, many yeah. people know instantly what that is. That's just yeah, wow. it's it's a Start, right? it, it, off with that. We, st we started playing the song with the artistics and immediately there was this reaction from our, uh, you know, rather small audience, but maybe 50 or 100 people out there. And uh, they really loved the song. So we thought, wow, we should do more of this. 
So then we wrote another song and then another. And it- uh, And at what point, you know, then you were finishing up your arts education in Providence. And at some point you said, we got to get to New York. This is where we have to go. That's where the scene is. If we're going to take this seriously. Yes. And New York, we moved to New York because people like Andy Warhol were in New York and Robert Rauschenberg and Merce Cunningham and uh, Lou Reed. Lou Reed was in New York. Uh, you know, uh, it was to, to us, it was the center of the cultural universe. Mm -hmm. And always with Talking Heads, even before we had our, our name, before we even had an, a name for our band, we, we thought our, our objective, it would be great to be famous. It would be great to make some money, but really what we wanna do is make our mark in musical history. And that, that's so interesting you know, where you, you that, that kind of uh, mindset coming from RISD where you're doing arts for art's sake, the art, you know, not necessarily thinking about the commercial, but to be original. Yes. Very yes. much a force. Yeah. And we, we, uh, we were very fortunate to move into a, a neighborhood uh, right around the corner from CBGB's, uh, this club in New oh, York. Yes. Describe for us what the corner of like Houston and the Bowery was in 1974. <laughs> Paint a picture of that well, environment completely different today. Yeah. So it, was, world, it, was, so. it was bad. It was bad. Yeah very bad. Uh, I never, you know, I grew up in nice suburban neighborhoods and, and the, you know, later on the College Hill in Providence. It wasn't like that. It was uh, guys that were at the end of their rope, uh, hanging out, um, you know, bad, bad alcoholics. And we call, today we call them homeless people. Uh, in those days, they were known as bums. And yeah. No, but nobody had much sympathy for them. Right. The New Yorkers were pretty hard on those those guys, and uh, they, uh, you know, uh, they would they would come out if you got stopped at a stoplight at the corner of Houston and Bowery. Guys would come out with these oily rags and try to clean you. Oh, I remember kit. those days. Oh, absolutely. There's a quote in your book where you talk about because um, Deborah Harry was also down there, right? Part of the yes. CBGB. That, yeah. Um, Deborah and Tina were like um, roses in a rattlesnake's nest. <laughs> yeah. You know, these two beautiful women in this environment that yeah. you had to be because that's where the music was happening. That's where the scene was. Yes. The, the, yeah. I also write in my book that as bad as it, the conditions were, there was great art being created behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. You would never know it as you walk through there, but but that's where like Ornette Coleman was, and that's where uh, the great conceptual artist Vito Acconci was, and uh, Kate, Kate Millett, the right the feminist writer, oh, and uh, Willem Dafoe, and. Uh, who else? Probably still I mean, down there. Some of these people may still Patty, be. Patty Smith's oh. guitarist Lenny Kay, okay. uh, um, the Ramones. Uh, it was. It was. I well, mean, the Ramones, and that's that's a great. Thank you for segueing right into that because yeah. that was your um, first kind of touring partner, going down to CBGBs where they were playing, and yes. they allowed allowed you to play before that because I think their perception was. Oh, they're gonna suck. They're not gonna be any good. So we'll let them play. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. That, well, that was Johnny Ramone. Johnny <laughs> Ramone was sort of he he liked to so think Frankie. of himself as the, <laughs> the leader of the band. Yeah, and he said to Hilly Crystal, the owner of CBGBs, yeah. a wonderful man, said, "Well, said to me, well, I could put you on in front of the Ramones, and if it goes well, you can play with them the whole weekend." So I said, "Wow." great and uh this was our first gig ever that's amazing and, um and that's 75 1975 or yes spring, yeah. okay. may of 75 and, and then by 1976 you did something like 60 or 70 gigs the following year so you had very quick development of your band playing out yeah. and well you know we were gung-ho and we yeah. were we were young and we we really we we just said to ourselves 
Well, I said to myself, I'm going to give this five years. And if it oh. doesn't work out, I'm going to go back to painting. Because I, I knew that for a rock and roller, you kind of had to be young. But for a painter, you could be in your 40s and they'll still call you a young painter. So yeah. anyway, I thought, I think we all thought we're going to give this a shot and we're going to work really hard and see what happens. And uh, we we were very for, we were very fortunate after after two or three gigs we had our picture on the cover of the Village Voice, which is we, it's amazing for people young people now to understand how frenetic a time it was for um, labels to be signing bands, scouts out there watching. I mean that happens today as well, but it was such a fast moving scene. In yes, the 70s. yes. Things but happened. you know, uh, a lot of the record camp companies never came down to CBGBs. I mean. They, they just didn't. Their, their whole thing was kind of scary. <laughs> mid -town. And Did they, you know at the time, in the context of playing with television and the Ramones and Patti Smith, how innovative and different your sound was? Did it, at the time? Um, you know, the great thing was all the bands sounded different from, from yeah. one another. Yeah. Uh, Talking Heads, had we had our sound. Patty Smith Group had their sound. The Ramones had their sound. Right. Bondi had their sound. Um, other, other, all the every band was different. Um, there were a few copycats, you know, bands that. Well, it was also this time where you the, the popular music was maybe Aerosmith and Fleetwood Mac and disco was a thing and punk was raging in England like crazy back then and yeah. and. Um, there's one statement in the book where you say that um, you were kind of post-punk before punk even happened. Yeah. So can we talk about what that means a little bit? Well, I think it was just our, our, our aesthetic and our, our look, our sort of, uh, I, I don't know how to describe our look, except to, I, I always say we wore the clothes that our moms gave us for Christmas. <laughs> so, you know, it's very different than when you think of Patti Smith and, and how she dressed and how the Ramones, it's a very different aesthetic for sure. Yeah. Was yeah. It a little bit of, were you kind of like the college kids and they were more the street kids? Was there a little? Yes, I think so. Yeah. Well, the, we, we didn't try to promote the fact that we, were, we had been to college, but the journalists and people like that latched onto that very quickly. Yeah. Uh, and to, to their way of thinking, that kind of separated us. The yeah. fact that we'd been to a real art school kind of separated us from other bands. Yeah. And, you know, we have so much to talk about and there are so many questions coming in from the audience. Okay, let's hear them. Fantastic. But I've, you know, and I, I have a thousand questions myself, but I, um, I want to give you a chance to talk about what you want to talk about for a few more minutes, then we can dive into the audience a little, little bit. And I, um, I know the Talking Heads has been great success. And then with the Tom Tom Club, what I find really interesting is later on with the Tom Tom Club, is this emergence of like the feminine role in rock and roll and what Tina was able to bring to it. And I wonder today with the Tom Tom Club, where you see Tina's kind of legacy with women in music coming out of the heads and into into Tom Tom Club. Yeah, well, well, you know, um, she's not only in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but she's also in the Connecticut Women's Hall of Fame. Yes, I know. Which, yes. which, was, which was, that was a wonderful moment for her and for me, uh, the, you know, we, uh, the Connecticut. I mean, she, she made Connecticut. such an impact on. But she, she Tina has, is, is iconic and, um, it, it, she, she was self-taught, you know, some people think David taught her to play bass. David doesn't play bass. Uh, some people think I taught her to play, I don't play bass. She taught herself, you know, and um, she brought, she brought something new to, to the style of bass playing. Uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, to the way yeah. bass is played. She, she's like funky and yet classical at the same time. It's yeah. pretty wild. She um, came into it from a different perspective and it was so enriching to the yes. sound of the talking heads. I mean, your, your duo, your rhythm section duo was just unlike any other. And- um, well, Yeah, yeah, we, 
tremendous. And we, you know, we really enjoy playing together too. We really do. But, but what was I, I was going to say that, um, not just women have told me, you know, Tina inspired me to play the bass, but also men, like young men will tell me, you know, I play the bass. I was inspired to pick up the bass by Tina. And I think, wow, it's fantastic. That's you know? cool. That's really cool. I love that. Yeah. I and mean, what, what a better thing than to inspire people to do what you're doing because it's fun and you're enjoying it. You made success. And yeah. in reading the book, and I encourage folks to read the book, you can go online and purchase it through the library and you'll get a book plate from Chris signed and everything. So please do that if you don't have a copy. Mine is dog-eared in lots of places and I wish we had like three hours to talk. Um, and, and reading through the book, there's a lot of detail about recording sessions and how you created your music through imp improvisation and jamming, the whole jam style of coming up with the sound of songs. Yeah. Um, can you speak to some like magical moments that happen in the studio where you just speak to that a little bit in the creative, creative process? Well, uh, there were quite a few. Um, uh, the the first time when we recorded our first album and we you know you know in our in our loft on the lower east side and and later long island city at first we didn't even have a tape recorder so all we knew about our sound was what we could hear with our own ears we didn't know how it sounded recorded how it would sound right. and we, when we heard the playback like the mixes of our first album I was like, whoa, man, we really did it. We did it. <laughs> and uh, there was no doubt in my mind that, that this little record, this 12 inch record was going to, you know, have some impact. And it, it took a while. It did take a while. But yeah, yeah the, but what a cool feeling, like, you, like knowing that moment when you got something and yeah. then hearing it and then and then having success very quickly going on tour early with Ramones and your music movie on the charts and so on and so uh, on and um another another time another time was uh in, in remain in light recording remain in light in the bahamas and hearing the playbacks and how different they were from anything we'd ever done before and how different they were from anything anybody else was doing at that time that was very exciting to hear uh, so exciting that I think Eno and David decided this is ours. We're gonna, we're yeah, gonna, you know, we're gonna say really, we did this. It's such an interesting story because there's a lot, lot of myths out there about bands, and there's always their families. So families have squabbles, and there's difficulties, and there's yeah. ownership issues about creativity and and all right. of that. And you do talk about that in your book. Some of the things that you struggled with. Yes. Um, and the I, band think, split I, off. Think, I think most bands, most bands have these yeah. struggles, these twists and turns and bumps in the road. Uh, sure. You just, you have to ride it out and f f figure out a way to, uh, you know, transcend that so that the- Well, the, and you the, did, you so worked at it for a long time. Yeah. Uh, another magical I, moment was, was the, <laughs> first Tom Tom Club album. Oh, man. Yes, yeah, right. right. Exactly. <clears throat> I'll tell you Phenomenal. a little story about that. When we, we, we uh, David was decided he was going to do a solo album. And right. Jer Jerry said, well, if David's going to do a solo album. I'm going to do a solo album. So Jerry was doing one. And uh, so Tina and I looked at each other and like, what are we going to do? And our accountant said, you better do something because uh -oh. yeah <laughs> and so so anyway uh our manager great guy named gary kerfirst went to his old friend chris blackwell of yeah. island records who owned compass point studios also and uh chris blackwell said well have chris and tina come down here to compass point and cut a single and if i like it they can do a whole album Okay. So we had this idea. Well, we're gonna we're gonna do something that sounds dancey that our friends at the Mud Club and Danceteria will dig. The DJs will dig and will play it. So we came up with this groove, and bass and drums, and um, then we needed lyrics. And Tina was very nervous about singing because she'd never sung lead vocals before. 
I said, Tina, you can just rap. There's this new thing called rap. Oh, is that crazy? Wow. It's And, and now yeah. rapping is not easy either. To do it well, it, it, it takes great skill. But she brought her two sisters, two of her sisters. She has many sisters. She brought two of them down to the Bahamas to sing with her. Uh, and uh, they were... They had to. Th they were trying to think of, you know, a, a, a melody for the song, for the chorus. And they went out. They went down to the beach, and one of Tina's sisters, Lonnie, said, "Hey, remember that that chant we used to do in school when we were in France? It goes rum sum sum or rum sum sum, cooney 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 rum sum sum." And yeah. Tina and her, the other sister, Laura, said, "Oh yeah." And yeah. Anyway, they, they locked arms, they came chanting back to the studio and they said, the we, got, going? <laughs> we, we got something to record. And they went out into the studio and uh, turned on the mics and they recorded Ram Sam Sam or Ram Sam. And it was like so new and so fresh. I said to myself, hallelujah. And um, the, the song ended up being called Wordy Rapping Hood. Yeah. It's, a song yeah. about words and the power oh, of words. it's great and then it, it went out um launched and hit the charts in europe cr cr we, call, and we called chris blackwell, we called chris blackwell into the studio we said okay chris what do you think of this we played it for him he big smile on his face he said play that one more time we played it again he said okay i want to release this immediately yeah in europe and latin america and then I want you to get to work on the rest of the album. So that's what happened. And it was a, it was a hit. It was not really. And, and it's still being discovered. States. It's being discovered today. The, the music that from, from Tom, Tom Club, that's sampled by, you know, hip hop and yeah. Mariah, from yeah. Mariah Carey. I mean, it's just phenomenal. And um, so it just shows, you know, something that you, the two of you had that was part of Talking Heads you had it, right? And you could go on yeah. and create something new and continue. So your talent was, is immense. And it's, we're just all the beneficiaries of you sharing it and continuing to grow. And I, um, as the sign from all the questions on our audience, I'd love to dip into a few now. So even though we could talk for hours, um, we have a question about um, who and what drummers have inspired you? Where did you get oh. your drumming inspiration from? Oh, so many, you know, but yeah. But um, one of the first was the great Gene Krupa. My, my, my dad had some of his, rec some records that Gene Krupa played on. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. I, as, as a very young kid, I would listen to those and think, whoa, dig those drums, man. And uh, then later on, uh, a band called The Ventures. I love the drummer in The Ventures. And, and then of course there was Ringo from the Beatles and there was, Charlie nice. from the Rolling Stones. <clears throat> and then I discovered, I went to school for a couple of years in Virginia and I discovered soul music. So, so I became uh, very, very fond of, particularly the, the music that came out of Memphis, uh, mm. Stax music. And, and there was a drummer that played with Booker T and the MGs called and later with Al Green called mm. Al Jackson Jr. So all those sounds, that explains a lot of the, the um, melding of genre and, 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 in your- and, You know, there are so, so yeah. many drummers that I, that I love. Uh, even, even a guy who didn't even play on many of his own records, but sometimes he did. And when he did, I really loved that. And it was uh, Dennis Wilson from the Beach Boys. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there, yeah. there's so many great drummers out there. Yeah, yeah. well, you, you're one of them, I think. So there you go. Um, <laughs> so let's see, I have a question here about um, uh, what was the most thrilling place or setting you ever performed in? And can you describe that feeling of that place and all the places in the world from Japan to Greece and Rome and... Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. I 
It's a good question. I guess the most beautiful is Red Rocks in Colorado, mm -hmm. the, the natural amphitheater that's up in the mountains. And yeah. it's, all, it's all giant craggy rock cliffs and boulders all around. And it's very exciting. They have oxygen tanks on the side of the stage so you can go get a whiff when you start, you know. Accommodating. The, the altitude is really high there. Oh, cool. I've never been out there. I'll have to put it on my bucket list. Yeah, it's like, um, a, it's, 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 uh, it's very, very high altitude. Yeah. And, and uh, another place um, I love to play is the Paradiso in, in Amsterdam. It's a, mm. it's, it used to be a church and then it was, they still have church mm. services in there on Sundays, but, but cool. the rest, rest of the week, it's like a, a music and arts place. Uh, so I love the performance venue. Oh, cool. Radio City Music Hall. That's a good one. We, uh, we, one we played, sure. played there two nights in a row, sold out both nights. See, we could have played met one night at Madison Square Garden but no, we said, I think our friend, we think our fans would prefer uh, Radio City Music Hall. So we well, played two nights I, there. I saw you at, um, in 83 at Forest Hills. I was at that show. I saw. That, that was a good one. That yeah. was fun. That was really fun. I, that was one of the best concerts ever um, for me. Yeah. Um, had, there, a lot had, of there been, had there been a roof, we would have torn it off. <laughs> totally. We rushed up to the stage and we're hearing the sounds and playing some of the Remain and Light music with jetliners flying overhead. It was pretty cool, yeah. <laughs> I have to say. Um, so there's several questions asking about how you feel um, when Talking Heads music is used today, particularly with David Byrne and American Utopia and your kind of thoughts about that project. Well, I'm I'm to very people that I'm, are curious. I'm I'm very happy for David that he has that uh, enormous success with uh, yeah. Talking okay. Heads songs. Uh, but I must tell you, yeah. Broadway musicals are not really my thing. Sorry, I, I'm I'm more of a uh, for everybody. You're not you're not feeling like you're missing out on anything, which is a okay. <laughs> I mean, some people that is their thing. They love it. And they yeah. live, they live for that, but yeah. but not me. You got enough interest. I'm not, I'm not worried about you being inspired by music and creativity. It seems to be everywhere. Um, let's see. Let me see. Couple, got about twenty questions here. So apologies if we can't get to your questions. Um, is there a reason Tina didn't? Tom asks. Is there a reason Tina didn't co-write the book with you? Since your oh. stories are so <laughs> entwined. A good reason. She's writing her own book. Ooh. <laughs> it, it's going to be a doozy. Uh, really? What's her theme? Is it a, is it a memoir or is it? It is. A, it is a, as far as I know, it's a memoir. Yes. I haven't seen okay. anything yet, but she's at the notes taking stage and she's very meticulous and uh, very thorough and well, I hope when she publishes it, she comes to see us. We would love it. <laughs> I'm sure she will. Put that out there. Um, that's really interesting. Are you yeah. going to write another book yourself? Yeah, I'm. 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 I'm I have a, a good idea. Uh, well, I think it's a good idea, and um, I'm. I'm trying to sort of uh, figure out what's the best way to do it. And I. I can't tell you anything about it right okay. now. Okay. All right, we'll have a big reveal when you're, whenever you're ready, we're here for you. You yeah. know that. Um, what do you listen to today? Well, uh, you know what I listened to today, actually really today was um, my niece. Her name is Fiona Howell, H-O-W-E-L-L. -L, and she's uh, somehow become totally, I mean, for years now, totally uh, absorbed by traditional Irish music. She plays the flute. Ooh, so I've been listening uh, to her new CD. And, uh, you know, I, I love it that, you know, uh, she's not the only uh, uh, niece or nephew or, or offspring that we have that, that's into music. But I, I, I love it that the, the kids are, are, are 
doing this, you know. Yeah. Well, you have other musicians in your family, right? Your yes, uh, our, our son, Robin, is a, a, a DJ and a music, electronic music producer. And uh, uh, our other son is a painter yeah. preparing for a show in, in Seoul, Korea. Oh, big so show. Wow. So, uh, well, I know also you, you're, you're very involved in the local community. I know you have the program on WPKN and you're aware of the music around our area. And we're really lucky here to yeah. have such rich. Oh, yes, 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 yes. So let's talk about, um, with the Westport Library, we're going to be having uh, what we're calling the Lockdown Concert on March 13th, which you're producing for us. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm the curator. The curator. And, um, yeah, some wonderful bands have have volunteered, yeah. and uh, it's it's going to be a couple or three hours of really great music, and it, it, same station as this, I think. <laughs> yeah, it'll, but they're pre pre produced, and you're going to put them together and talk in between, and we'll talk also a little bit about. Um, this is a question I have for you. So we have at the Westport Library these amazing media studios, which we'll talk a little bit more about at the uh -huh. lockdown concert. Do you think if the Talking Heads were around today, wouldn't it be cool to be creating an album in a library? Wouldn't that be kind of a... Yeah. Right? Uh, it, so, it, it would be. And yeah. I, love, I love that big video screen that you have too. And yeah, yeah. It's, it's amazing place. Yeah, so the 13th, so people who are listening, you, we don't have the, um, all the information out yet about it, but mark your calendars, March 13th, it'll be a probably a two hour virtual concert with all kinds of local bands, uh, Deep Banana Blackout, Zena and Olander, Mystic Bowie, Talking Dreads, we'll have Plastic Ivy. You've got, you put together an amazing array of bands. So we yeah, hope- they're really good. Fun. Some of them are quite young too. So. Yeah, yeah, kind of up and coming and really interesting sounds, a real diverse array of sounds. So yeah. we're really looking forward to that. And um, so that's March 13th. Um, let me see other questions here. What brought you to Connecticut is a question. Oh, well, our, our accountants, we had a couple of good years and our accountant said, you should buy a house. So we, we said, oh, okay. And we started looking in, in Manhattan and everything we saw was so expensive. I mean, th this was back in 1984. Okay, and, yeah. Uh, you know, it seemed... Everything seemed out of our reach, so uh, uh, we 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 didn't didn't really want to go to New Jersey, and we did look at a few places in Westchester, but uh, one one day we got on the train and we went up to Westport, and uh, we we looked around and we really liked the ambiance. Mm. And it wasn't too far from New York, so we could commute fairly easily. Although I must admit, I got sick of that commute. <laughs> that be great. You know, I remember when I was, there was a, a record store that used to be on the post road called Records and Tapes. Yes. And I remember going in there and buying a Talking Heads album. Westport Records and Tapes. Yes. And the owner, and I can't remember her name, she said, well, you know, they just bought a house here. And I was like, yeah, what? yeah. <laughs> so. That's funny. Um, so anyway, we we looked up here, and 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 the uh, the second place we looked at is the place we ended up buying, where we we've lived since 1985. Well, we're glad you're here because you bring a lot to the landscape, and I know that for those of you Thank out there listening, Chris has had a monthly radio show on WPKM, but during COVID, it's not really happening. But pay attention to when that resumes. It's a great show. Friday afternoons once a month, four to six o'clock, I think is your yeah, it's something like that. Yeah. Four to four to seven. Four to uh, seven. Drive okay. time, they call it. Yeah. 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 Um, okay, let me see if I can get through some of these questions because we have a great group of people watching. Um, what were your favorite um heads and non-head songs to perform? Well, uh I I love I love to play Take Me to the River. Oh, that's a great song. Uh, Stops me in my tracks whenever it pops on the radio. No, it's a, it's an Al Green song, but a lot of people know it as a Talking Heads song, even even though you know we didn't write it. Yeah. But um, I, I love to play. 
this must be the place, although I haven't played it for a long time, but it's just a beautiful song to, yeah. to it's be It's a love song, of. which is unusual, right? The, you don't think of the Talking Heads as writing love songs, but that's kind right. of... Right, it was kind of unusual for, for, for us. Yeah. Uh, and I like very much to play Genius of Love. Um, it, always, it, it always gets the audience like happy, you know, and, and, and that's fun. Do you think the Tom Tom Clubs will go back out and play? Have a tour? You know, you know, we had some concerts planned for last, sort of secret concerts planned for last March. Hmm but they didn't happen. Yeah. But I'll tell you what we do have. We have, um, we made an album, a Tom Tom Club album in the year 2000 called The Good, The Bad and The Funky. Yeah. And uh, we're re-releasing it on vinyl Ooh. for, for uh, the upcoming record store day. I'm not exactly sure when record store oh, day. I it, don't know when that is either, in, but it in is. The spring. Yeah, yeah. It, and you know, it, it's it's a limited edition. It's on color, like blue aquamarine vinyl. It's, so it's I cool. like that. I mean, I wish we had more time because I would love to talk more about your album and the art in your album covers. That's a whole other conversation now that you mentioned yeah. this special edition that you're going to put out for the Tom Tom Clubs, but all the influence of your art school are in every aspect of what, you, what you've done, which I find really interesting. Um, Let's see, we've got a few more minutes. Um, there's so many questions. You'll have to come back. That's all there is to it. You're gonna have to come back because we have a lot of questions for you. I, I have one question I'd like to ask. If you think about the kind of the sonic um, thumbprint of the talking heads and your legacy, where do you think that is in today's music? Where do you see the influences? Ah, well, um, you know, uh, uh, there, the, there's a lot of, a lot of bands that have used Talking, Talking Heads as sort of a, uh, a, a starting place, a springboard. Uh, uh, I, I would say Vampire Weekend is a, is a pretty good example of that. Interesting. Although, although they're not even really new anymore, are they? Aren't they? Been out maybe ten so, years. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Probably so, ten years about. Yeah. Hmm. Um, uh, when you talk about the really new bands, I, I I don't hear our influence so much, but 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 when you talk about bands from the the early two thousands and the nineties, the late nineties, I hear a lot of it. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, but everything's so electronic these days that uh, it, it. It's interesting to think like the way you made records. Yeah. Back then, it's so different today. They're just showing up in the studio and kind of. Yeah. Improv until something gels. It's too expensive to do that for one thing now, right? I mean, not that it was cheap then, but that's a well, very. You know, most people have their home studios now. So. Yeah. So uh, once you've got that, you don't really worry about paying by the hour or anything. But, but uh, no. you know, making, making music, the whole music business is so changed from, from when we were coming up. Yeah. I mean, it, not just the people, because the people that sort of ran the music business are all either dead or got fired. <laughs> well, and the whole business model for musicians has changed and it's tough. You've got a tour. You can't you make the money on the albums like you used to selling them. Yes. It's very, yeah, it's, very it's, tough business. And yeah, um, but we, 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 you know, we, we, we managed to do okay still with Talking Heads and Tom Tom Club, thanks to people like Netflix and, and uh, you know, HBO and, and yeah. There's different platforms. We sure. don't do, we don't do commercials uh, with Talking Heads, but we, we're in a lot of movies and a lot of TV shows, and and yeah. that that's a good income, you know. Oh sure, it, it creates a nice little royalty check, you know, if you get in a TV yeah. show or something like that. I'm just going to do another little plug for your book to let folks know that they can still get it through the library. I think up until 10:30 tonight, if you click on the link, and um, yeah. Great cover. Those of you who are fans, you know what this is. Um, 
Yeah, the um, Wild Enough to Remain in, in Light, the album, right? There's the, your copy. The, yep. Here's my copy. The <laughs> photo, photo was taken by a guy named Jimmy DeSena. And uh, yeah, we uh, there's a little bow uh, nod to uh, Remain in Light and, and also our first album cover, Talking Head 77. And a little bit, this is Jimmy Rizzi, Stars and Hearts, kind of like from Tom Club. And yeah. this was done by a woman who lives up in West Cornwall, Connecticut, uh, Megan Wilson. She's really good. Connecticut artist, love, gotta love that, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think we're just about at the end of our time. So I just, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of your questions. It's so exciting to, to have all of you here listening. And um, we hope to have you back. And we're excited that Tina's writing a book and that you're writing another one. And all this creativity is gonna go on and on and on. And here we have Alex back. And um, we, please join us on March 13th, all you music fans out there, watch for more information about the lockdown concert. And- Yeah, uh, thank you, Jennifer. And just wanted to pop on at the end here to, to, to wrap it up. And, and uh, first, like Jennifer said, please uh, buy copies of Remain in Love in the link in the, uh, in the chat. We've still got some copies and Chris was kind enough to sign book plates for us. So that's super cool. Get your signed copy uh, tonight. Um, and the Lockdown Fest, I put the bands that are going to be appearing at the festival uh, in the chat. So that's Saturday, March 13th at 7 o'clock. Check westportlibrary.org for more information. We'll have the whole lineup and some videos and some cool exclusive content coming really soon. Uh, and to Jennifer, I'm so happy you did this. Thank you so much for... Uh, I'm delighted. I enjoyed every second of it. And thank you so much, Chris. It was just really generous and kind of you to be here for the library and for our patrons and it's all a great those. pleasure and I, and thank you to uh Westport library. Yeah, Chris, it's, it's one of those, uh, I, I keep saying that it's just another pinch me moment for me that I, I uh, we, you know, we're going to be working together for the lockdown fest and, and uh, we really do appreciate the time and, and uh, you being here and, and, and for working with us. It really, it's, I mean, the word honor is like overused, but gosh, what an honor to be able to work with you. So thank you again. Amen. Thank you for writing this awesome book and thank you for being here and everybody out there. Thank you for being so engaged tonight and, and asking so many questions. Uh, we will subtly pressure Chris to come back to answer those questions. Um, <laughs> so in the meantime, everybody, please uh, be well, be safe and, and have a great night. Thank you all. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.